Hello and welcome. My name is Sarah Rosendahl. I work in the Springfield Green County Library District's Community Relations Department and serve as Project Director for Death and Dying Conversations on End of Life Matters. On behalf of the Library and the Series Planning Committee, thank you for joining us for this Death and Dying event, Funerals and the Impact of COVID-19 with Brent Barnes. This is our fourth year hosting the series, but we feel it's especially important that we offer the Death and Dying series this year to give people the opportunity to start conversations on these important topics as we face the challenges brought on by the pandemic. Thank you to the Hospice Foundation of the Ozarks for funding our series of virtual events. We appreciate their support for the Death and Dying series and other end of life projects in the community. We appreciate you joining us to help break the taboo of talking about death and start a community conversation on these end of life topics. We hope the, this event and the Death and Dying series as a whole inspires you to continue the conversation that we start here with the people in your life. Before we get started with the presentation, a reminder that the library continues to offer programs for both adults and children, just in a virtual format for the time being. If you'd like to receive emails about upcoming library programs, topical book lists, or library news, please visit the library.org slash newsletter to sign up for topics of interest. You'll be the first to know about library events, plus the emails make handy reminders. One more piece of housekeeping, we are unable to offer this event live due to the nature of our presenter's work, but we encourage you to leave your comments and questions in the comments section of this video. We'll share your questions with our presenter and respond to you as soon as possible. When we think about events and gatherings that have been affected by COVID-19. Funerals are certainly at the top of that list. As we've probably all watched stories on the news or experienced in person, the socially distant services and limits on public gatherings. Brent Barnes, a licensed funeral director, has been on the front lines of helping families navigate the complexities of COVID-19 that add to an already stressful situation. Brent has been a member of the Greenlawn family since 2008 and is currently the manager of Greenlawn North. We appreciate Brent sharing his expertise with us for this event. Hi, my name is Brent Barnes and I work at Greenlawn Funeral Home. I'm a manager and funeral director. And today I'd like to discuss the challenges that families and the funeral homes face uh, during the coronavirus. Uh, there's five things that I'd like to touch on. Number one, how has our funerals changed since the coronavirus? Number two, uh, making home removals, uh, picking up, in other words, picking up loved ones. Uh, number three, has the number of funerals increased since the pandemic? Number four, how has COVID affected us financially? And number five, have we had any of our families um, that did not want to follow the rules. So let's start off with number one. How has the funerals changed? Number one, uh, when it first started, the pandemic started, uh, we did a lot of gravesides. I bet for the first two months, we did 90% of them were gravesides that we had as far as a traditional funeral. Of course, cremations, cremations were cremations unless they wanted a memorial service. The other thing that people were doing was they were putting off their funerals for a later date. You know, a lot of families thought, well, two, three months from now, six months from now, this will all be over. Well, as you can see, it is not over. Uh, so we had families rescheduling uh, within a month or two, realizing that it wasn't going to be over and wanting to do their services. Uh, but we do still have families that have not done their funerals since the pandemic started. So one of the concerns that we had uh, when it's first started, when they're putting their funerals off, is uh, all the funerals starting to stack up, and are we going to have enough help and enough time to want to do the funerals to accommodate the families? Uh, the other thing that we started seeing was uh, there are a, a few more cremations that probably would have been a traditional funeral. Uh, I'd say, you know, here in this part of the area, or at least at Greenlawn, we didn't see a big difference, but we saw a little bit of a difference. Uh, the other thing was, was we started uh, using Zoom. Uh, that was a, a big change for us. Some of us that were uh, electronically challenged, um, you know, are having a rough time with this. Obviously, as you know, when you're dealing with electronics, they can and will go, uh, things will go wrong. Uh, and they have. 
the problem that we faced when we did the Zoom to start off with was the internet connection. Uh, when we lost internet connection, uh, Zoom went out, man, we're families mad. Now, you know, obviously it's, these things can go wrong, but you know, you try to accommodate the families as best as possible. And it's never easy on the funeral director in charge because you want everything to go perfect. Um, you know, the thing that we did is when it first came out is uh, our owners went out and bought uh, three big cameras to set up in our chapels. They went out and bought a laptop for each location. And uh, we had to learn how to use Zoom. And so not only did we have to do our funerals, but we also had to operate the, the laptop and the cameras during this whole time. So it could be a little stressful on us. Um, you know, uh, the other things that we found as far as uh, families challenging were uh, making the arrangements with families. Uh, if they were exposed to COVID, you know, they might have to wait 14 days or even longer before they can come in and make the arrangements. There were times when we had to do the arrangement process over the phone. Uh, we even Zoomed the arrangement process. Uh, process a couple of times. I mean, it's nice that we have the technology to be able to do these things, but these are some of the things and, and hurdles that we had to, to work out. Um, you know, uh, the other things that we had to do uh, to start off with, when it first came out, you'd only have 10 people at a funeral. That was the probably the biggest challenge we had of all. Because as you know, families have more than 10 people. When you got grandchildren, spouses, uh, children, great-grandchildren, cousins, all this, and not to mention the friends and relatives. I mean, the friends and neighbors that, uh, that want to come and pay their respect. So what we ended up doing in a lot of cases were either if we didn't put the funeral off, we might do a funeral, uh, maybe, you know, a graveside, or maybe a burial, immediate burial, and then we might have a memorial service uh, two or three different times. A good example, we might have the grandchildren come in, 10 of them come in and pay their respects and spend their time with their grandmother, grandfather, whatever it might be. And, uh, and when they left, then the next day it might be the parents, or maybe it's an hour later. There were a lot of different things that we were doing to try to meet the needs of families. Uh, so that was, that was a big challenge for us. Um, the other thing was, and people were very respectful of it, was the social distancing, keeping people six feet apart. Uh, you know, when we set our graveside services up and the chairs and things like that, we couldn't get them as close. We had to separate them. Uh, we did not set as many chairs up as we did in a lot of cases when we first started. Uh, we had to have people, and the nice thing about it was we were outside, so we could spread people out. Um, so, you know, that was a change for us. The other thing that we dealt with, as time went on, we went to 50% occupancy per square foot. Now that actually helped us out, and it helped the families out, of course, but we still had to make sure that we counted the number of people that were in the chapel. When one went out, one went in, uh, different things like that. And again, people were very respectful, so we didn't have any problems with most family members. Um, you know, we had to, uh, I laugh about this because we tried different things when we, we, we had every other pew uh, that we used for families to come in and uh, to try to separate people when we went to 50% occupancy. Well, we found out that uh, if we weren't watching the chapel, people would move the ribbon and go ahead and sit in that pew anyway. So we tried different things and believe it or not, one of the things that worked best was actually putting a sign in the seat itself and we put three in and maybe one long pew, we put three all the way through there. So they would either have to move it or sit directly on it. And that worked better than anything that we did. So um, again, we had every other pew that we used. If we did a procession as far as following people around, we had them go in one way and come out a different direction. So uh, there wasn't a, a, a pile of people that were conglomerating. So uh, again, that was not that big a challenge for us, but it was different for the families as far as not being able to fill the chapel up. If their loved one was well respected or they had a lot of friends and family, not, you know, not having a lot of people come to the funeral. The other thing that, uh, a challenge that we faced was, you know, 
been in the film industry for a while, you could somewhat predict how many people or how large your crowd would be for the funeral. Maybe by looking at how many flowers were uh, at the funeral or how many phone calls that you got. Well, since the pandemic, the, there was no way to predict it because uh, any other situation, you might have a big crowd, you could predict it, but with the pandemic, a lot of people weren't coming to the funerals. So it was very hard to try to figure out, you know, uh, how to set your chapel up or how to, you know, uh, how much staff to use for the funeral. So uh, that's one of the challenges that we faced. So the second thing I'd like to talk about uh, is home removals or making a removal with the nursing home or hospital or actually at the home if they pass away. The home removal, let's just talk about that. If we knew they were COVID-19, uh, we had a two-person team that would go in and do that removal. We have about seven to nine different people that are always on call all through the week. But if we knew they were COVID, those two people were the ones that made that call because we didn't want to take the risk of contaminating our employees and contaminating other people. So we always use those people. If it was an embalming, those same two people also did the embalming. Um, another thing, when we went in the home, we had to change the way uh, we went in and made a removal. Uh, you know, we had to use, start using body bags on everybody. Uh, the drawback to this was the respect uh, that the family was sitting, sitting there watching you make the removal. They don't want to see their loved one being zipped up in a body bag. So, uh, with a little bit of research and talking to other funeral homes, uh, we found a company that made body bags that did not zip up. And they were much larger, too. So, what you could do is you could actually wrap them around the cot after you're in there. You could move the loved one over. Then you could wrap that around that uh, decedent. And it was a little more comforting than actually having to zip up a body bag. Um, but again, the difference that we had to do with the, our, we had to make with our employees is during the removal, not only did we have to use body bags, but we went through several pairs of gloves during that one removal. We also had to cover the face before we moved them over to the cot. Uh, there were just a lot of different things that we had to do that we weren't used to. Uh, so, uh, that's one aspect as far as the home removal, what we had to do. Uh, if we went into a nursing home, uh, a lot of things changed there. We would bring the cop to the nursing home, we'd stop at the front door, call them, or ring the bell, and then they would come uh, to the front door or to the door that we were at, and then they would take the cot and do the removal themselves. Now, that was, that was nice for us because we didn't physically have to go in and, and do all that, but what the challenges that we faced were when they bring the cot out, obviously we're going to have to uh, disinfect the cot before we touch, before we touch it. Uh, you know, we, we still have to put them in the van and we still have to take them back to the funeral home. When we get them back to the funeral home, we still have to disinfect everything over again. Uh, we have to change our gloves numerous amounts of times. Obviously everyone's wearing uh, face masks. Um, shoe coverings, all the different things that you have to have. Uh, all the disinfectants, mopping the floor after you're done. Uh, the cots, the rollers that are on the cots, you have to wipe them down or spray them down every single time it's being used. Uh, over and over and over, uh, it gets to the point where you get tired of smelling all the disinfectants around the funeral home and um, in our vehicles. But it's a necessity. So, uh, Thirdly, or not thirdly, but the other thing is making a, a removal in a hospital. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things, uh, whether it be dealing with the security guard, um, you know, uh, having to go in and make the removal, um, you know, having to check your temperature, go through all this stuff before you go in and actually make the removal. So uh, there's a lot of challenges when it comes to um, going and picking up a loved one. Third thing. Uh, that people want to know, and that is, has the number of funerals increased? Uh, I, I would say yes, in this area, a little bit. They have nothing like New York. 
uh, or places like New York. You've seen on the news where they're using ref uh, refrigeration trucks to, to hold the bodies in. Um, you know, I can't imagine. You know, I, I happened to talk to a funeral director uh, on the phone uh, here a while back, and he was talking about what they're having to go through. And one of the things they talked about was uh, just the amount of hours employees were working, let alone uh, having to deal with families and putting off funerals and putting them in refrigeration trucks. But the hours, uh, they were working two and three months and maybe getting one, two, or three days off uh, taking shifts with other employees. So they were getting burnout, uh, exhaustion, and fortunately for us, we didn't see a lot of that. Now, we did have to work more hours, uh, a lot more work went involved, uh, you know, in removals, funerals, and different things like that. So yes, there was overtime that we had to deal with, but nothing like what they had to deal with. Uh, you know, the fourth thing I want to talk about is, and that is, uh, has the COVID affected us financially? Uh, it has. Um, the things that you don't think about are how many pairs of gloves you go through, how many boxes of gloves we have to purchase, masks, we have masks setting out for uh, people that come to the funeral that forgot or don't have a mask, they are free to take one if they need one, uh, shoe coverings, all the disinfectants. Uh, I know for a fact, uh, you, and you probably know how hard it is to get uh, certain things like disinfectants, Clorox wipes, things like that. It's, it's difficult for everybody. Uh, so uh, we spent a lot of time just searching for those type of things. And when we found it, we would buy as much as we possibly could. Uh, you know, luckily for us, we had people in the fuel industry uh, that knew of people and places to go to get disinfectants. And we ordered large quantities of it. So we spent hundreds of dollars doing this. Not to mention the cameras, the laptops, the things for Zoom, all the electronics. Uh, you know, we got the fast. We had the fastest speeds in the first place on the internet, but we did everything we possibly could to accommodate the families. The thing that people don't uh, understand about the funeral industry, and I have people tell us or tell me all the time, they say, "Well, one thing about the funeral business is you never have to worry about your job layoffs or, or, or uh, you know, you, you're always needed." She'll always have a job. Well, that's not always the case. And I tell people, I tell them like this. I say, here's the thing. If, if you have a funeral that does, a funeral home that does 500 funerals a year, let's just say. And out of those 500 funerals, 400 of them are traditional funerals. What I mean by traditional funeral, that's a burial of some sort, casket. You know, let's just say they're spending $5,000 on it. Uh, versus cremation, let's say you're spending 1000 2,000, whatever it might be on a cremation. Well, now as time goes on, our cremation rate rises. Now the pandemic's here. We're having a few more cremations than we did before. So now, instead of getting $5,000 for that funeral, now you're getting 1,000 or 2,000, whatever it might be. Well, when you go from 100 cremations to maybe 200, maybe 300 cremations, well, the funeral home still has overhead, they still have employees, they still have property taxes, insurance, uh, employees want benefits, things like that. And the thing of it is, as you know, taxes and insurance does not go down, it goes up. Well, uh, you know, people want nice facilities, so we're always having to uh, remodel, we're always having to put new carpet in, new tile, whatever it might be, every so many years. and. Uh, these are the things that we face. We had to buy more chemicals. We have, you know, all these different things that we have to do, but yet uh, the impact as far as making more money in the film industry is actually going down. So these are the things that we have to deal with to juggle. And if you're doing more cremations, obviously you gotta, you know, every business has to cut expenses if they have to cut expenses. I'm not saying that we had to do that, but you know, these are the things that funeral homes have to look at. So if you're doing five times or three times as many cremations as you did, obviously you're going to have to cut maybe employees. But that doesn't mean there's less work involved because actually in a lot of cases there's more work involved. You're still having to make the pickup. You're, you're still having to do here at Greenlawn Funeral Home, we do ID views. Everybody who's being cremated 
uh, must be ID before we do a cremation. That's very big here at Green Lawn Funeral Home. Uh, matter of fact, we just remodeled our crematory. We have our own crematory. And we even put in a window, a glass window, where people could, uh, could, could watch the cremation. And believe it or not, we have people that want to see that. Now they more than ever. Uh, we also are having people give them the opportunity not just to ID view, but they get an opportunity to spend time with their loved one and see them one more time before we cremate. There are times when there are kids, grandkids, or whatever the situation might be, to where they didn't get an opportunity. They lived out of town, didn't get to see grandma or mom. So we give them that other opportunity. We clean them up. Obviously, we don't do the embalming when it comes to cremation if there's no embalming, but we do clean them up, make them look nice and presentable, uh, and so forth. Now, if COVID's involved, then that's a whole new ball game. But we do have a window so they do get to see their loved one through that window one more time before we do the cremation. So that's the one impact I think that's made a difference when it comes to COVID. Uh, not to mention we gotta be very cautious when we're handling that loved one that has COVID. So the risk factor is that much greater. So these are the things that we've had to deal with, but again, we're here to accommodate the families as best as we possibly can. The other thing, um, and the last one is number five is, you know, have the families, have they been hard to deal with? Are they following the rules? Things like that. You know, for the most part, I think families have been very gracious. They've been very good to work with. They completely understood, you know, the situation that we're in, they understand the situation they're in. And uh, at first we were unsure of how people would do you know, or how people would react. Because when you lose a loved one, you know, um, that's some, some <clears throat> excuse me, that's some of the worst moments that they can face. But <clears throat> we've had a very good families to deal with and, and they've all been very respectful. Uh, again, <clears throat> we've had to limit people coming in. We ask them, you know, we're at our limitation. We'll have to wait till, if it's a visitation, we have to wait till a person or two or three go out before you can come in and they completely understand and they don't hesitate. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe the one thing that we have come across and I think it's just, you know, even I've caught myself doing this and that is forgetting to put your mask on. So we have to remind them to put their mask on when they come in. And if they don't have one, we have one there sitting there for them. And But for the most part, you know, I think maybe one or two people at the most that we have we come across that did not want to wear a mask or said that they were uh, uh, they had limitations or ability or uh, health risks that they could not wear a mask. It's the only time we ever come across that. So, but for the most part, everybody's been great. You know, uh, and the last thing I want to leave you with is is this, and this is just my personal opinion. Um, you know, we all have rights. We live in a free country. But you know, we want to do what's right. And what we have seen is if you wear a mask, obviously it's working. Um, you know, do I like wearing a mask? Absolutely not. But I think it's the right thing to do. And I think if we, if we follow the rules and, and, and get on top of these things, I think then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end this pandemic that we have uh, very soon. If you have any questions, feel free. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for Funerals and the Impact of COVID-19. Our next event is Compounding Our Sorrow, Grieving During a Pandemic on Thursday, November 12th at 7 p.m. The complete schedule of series events is available online at thelibrary.org slash death. In bookings and in program guides available at all branches. Visit thelibrary.org slash death again for links to these virtual events. Thank you.